New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast. And I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast mini-series titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I have put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Guided selling from Ring DNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts or hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let RingDNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. Generally, what you see with new managers, a lot of times, first time managers hold their meetings at the wrong time of day. And if it's not productive, then the sellers resent it. This whole idea of having productive meetings is actually a big one. I've seen some sales managers lose their team, if you will, because the meetings they held were just unproductive. Yeah, unfortunately, meetings by nature are unproductive. I mean, there's so many bad meetings out there. It really turns off the employees. And the more it goes on, the worse it gets. Something like 67% of all meetings are a waste of time. Something like that. It's a huge majority of meetings are basically a waste of time. Hey friends, welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. Now that was Peter Economy. Peter's a columnist on management issues for Inc. Magazine and the author of a new book titled, Wait, I'm the Boss, the Essential Guide for New Managers to Succeed from Day One. And Peter's joining me today on Sales Enablement, episode 778, to talk about why you can't rely on a company to train and enable you to be a good manager. And we'll talk about all the things you can do to effectively educate and train yourself to succeed. As Peter describes, on average, most managers receive their first leadership training after they've been on the job as a manager for 10 years. 10 years, which means managers are learning on the job with all of you as their experimental test subjects as they try to figure out what they should be doing. So we'll dig into the four steps that research says are the keys to becoming a good manager And we'll also dive into how to go about setting clear goals, and we'll get into how to build a true learning organization. All this and much, much more. Before we get to Peter, I want to let you know that the whole team of people who work to produce this podcast are incredibly grateful for all of you who support us by listening to the show, telling your friends, sharing it on social media, and most importantly, subscribing to the show and giving us your feedback in the form of a rating and a review. And if you haven't already connected with me on LinkedIn, please do. That's where I'm having a lot of conversations about sales topics these days. Go there, drop me a message. If you have a question about anything that we discuss on the show, I'll make sure I get back to you. So thank you on that. All right, let's jump into it. Peter, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here, Andy. Thanks so much. So where are you joining us from? Where are you sheltering in place? I am in the San Diego area. It's uh, sunny. It's about 89 degrees. We're toasting out here. You must be inland. We are. Yeah, we're about probably 20 miles from the ocean. Okay. Yeah, it's like two different worlds, and people don't know San Diego. You're either found when, when I moved there initially, you made a decision. You're either sort of a coastal person or more of a desert person, <laughs> and, and never the twain shall meet almost. 
Yeah, we tried the de- desert experiment. It didn't work, so we're heading back to the coast. Okay. <laughs> oh, so you were on the coast originally? Yeah, I lived in uh, initially in Pacific Beach area of San Diego, oh, and then, then La Jolla for like twenty or almost twenty years. So yeah. Yeah. So you tried the tried the inland, and now you're back. Okay. We're going back. Going back. All right. Well, welcome to the show. We're going to talk about. Uh, yeah, new managers, frontline managers, and the lessons they need to learn. Uh, you've got a book out called Wait, I'm the Boss, the Essential Guide for New Managers to Succeed from Day One, um, which is quite a, <laughs> quite a challenge to uh, to do that because, you know, we find, and you talk about this as, you know, at least in sales, when frontline managers just don't get trained. And so they're really thrown into the the deep end of the pool is, hey, you not only have to get the X number of you know, members of your team to perform to a certain level, but you've got to make this happen without any training. Yeah, it's really a, a difficult situation. I mean, you can imagine um, how many people, and this is really one of the greatest challenges for any new manager, is that you've been you know great at whatever it was you did, what you you know what your job is. So if you were a great salesperson, you were the the top salesperson on your team. And so all of a sudden, the, the sales manager says, hey, I'm going to tap you to be my assistant. I want you to become an assistant sales manager or something like that and start, start becoming a manager, um, but without any sort of training, without anything, but just sort of the osmosis of watching someone else be a manager. And the problem, one of the problems with that is, is that many managers just aren't any good. Um, in fact, you know, Gallup, <laughs> Gallup, yeah. Gallup has what? found shocking. That, yeah, it's a big shocker. Gallup has found that bad bosses are the number one reason why employees quit their jobs. So there's a lot of them out there. And if you're learning from a bad boss, if, if your model for becoming a manager is a bad model, then chances are you may be a bad manager yourself. So yeah, it's unfortunate that, that not, not much training happens, if any training at all. And unfortunately, th- these habits become very deeply grooved and hard to break. Well, you had an interesting stat in the book, which was that on average, managers get their first leadership training at age 42, Mm -hmm. meaning on average, you said about 10 years after they become managers. I mean, this is, I find that, I mean, I I shouldn't be laughing because I, on one hand, it's astonishing that we continue to do this. I'm not laughing at the fact that that we ignore managers because, yeah, I I actually had two weeks of, of management training when I within about a few months of being promoted to manager for the first time and for the next 20 years 22 years i worked for companies before starting my own none right and all in management positions never ever again received any you know one tidbit of management training yeah and and i'm not sure what what size company that was but you know most they were all, all sizes yeah yeah most of the largest companies you know your fortune 500 type companies they have massive leadership training programs. I mean, they'll pick you out when you're young. They'll say, this looks like someone with leadership potential, and they'll put you on a leadership track. And they'll you know, assign you to different jobs around the world and, and progressively more responsible leadership positions with training all along the way. But that's a pretty rare thing. I mean, that's the largest companies. Most small and medium businesses don't do anything like that. Uh, I think there's statistics that show around maybe 24 minutes a year at the most that most leaders may get from a small business mm-hmm. and even even less from a, a medium sized business maybe 12 minutes a year or something like that it's 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 negligible if you're getting any training at all so uh, it's it's a big problem and unfortunately many managers many leaders don't have the tools they need to do a good job doing the job they're supposed to do well and this is really pervasive in sales and we've had conversations with other people about this on the show is that there's this expectation too that not just frontline managers, but up and down the management chain, is they must be an expert on you know performance management, leadership, you know all the attributes you need to to lead and manage a team to higher levels of performance, and that's just too much to ask of one person. And yet we've had this model ingrained. I mean, on the sales side, on the the, the level of the sellers themselves, the big trend over the last 10 years is we've we've said, look, you know, people need to become much more specialized in specific roles in sales uh, in this modern environment, which is absolutely appropriate, and yet on the management side, hasn't changed one iota. 
Yeah, and 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 the, I guess on the you know the management side of things, uh, it, it's it's quite a generalist position. It's not a real specialization. There's just so many different things you're supposed to be good at. Everything from hiring to firing to, like you said, performance management, setting goals, motivating, I mean, motivating your employees, uh, tracking their performance. Um, there's just so many things. And then actually just running your company. I mean, in, in addition to all the people side of things, you're supposed to be making sure that the company is operating, your department's operating, that it's doing the things it's supposed to do. So the just the sheer breadth of what you're supposed to know as a manager is is, is overwhelming for most managers, and uh, many of them end up failing as a result. Well, you referred to this in the book, and it's other research been out there. I mean, in sales, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I know in gosh, in, in the valley, in Silicon Valley, I think the average tenure now for uh, a sales manager is like a year and a half. Oh, geez, wow. I mean, it's like. <laughs> they I mean, just get ground you, up, right? You, that's exactly right, right? I mean, the, the high demands, high intensity, and I, my senses from talking to people across the country on this show and and so on is that, you know, we're starting to see that happen in other industries as well. It's just the expectations are are unreasonable, and people as I said get, as you said, get chewed up and ground up and spit out, and the impact on people work for them is huge because there's no continuity. Yeah. Yeah, and and but regardless of all that, I mean, you there is there, there there is a need for someone, you know, a manager to run things. There is that need. So how do you get that done? How do you accomplish those different, you know, tasks, those different responsibilities without grinding up the managers? And I, I would certainly say that a lot of that has to do with again training. With making sure that you you're training those those people in the skills they need, instead of throwing them into the deep end, like you said, which is so often the case, you get thrown into the deep end and see if they swim or not. Um, why not give them a life preserver? Why don't you give them a a life vest that they can wear so they don't sink? You know, give them the training they need to to stay afloat. But as you pointed out, that's just not happening, right? It's so not. I think that one of the themes I thought of the book that I took away was that you know the the um, you really have to self-enable yourself, right. right? I mean, you have to take responsibility that you're, unlike if you want to be a manager, you're not going to, for most cases, other than you know, the large companies, you're only going to get sort of lip service to training a manager's 24 minutes a year, which is, you just envision what that that is. In the sales side, it's like, well, yeah, we hire somebody like Peter to come in and spend uh, 40 minutes talking at a sales mm-hmm. kickoff meeting. And then we we say that's training for the year. And, you know, with the forgetting curve, people forget 70, 90% of it within 24 hours. And it doesn't help anybody. So you really have to learn how to take responsibility for your own development. That's exactly right. I mean, you can't say, well, just because they're not training me, I'm going to quit or I'm going to go somewhere else where they're training me. I think a much better attitude and response would be to say, I'm going to, I'm going to empower myself. I'm going to, I am going to train myself. I'm going to pick up a book like this or there's, you know, there's all sorts of books out there on leadership and management and, you know, obviously in the sales areas too, sales management, but you can empower yourself. You can learn the skills yourself. And, and that's what the book I wrote is, is all about is, is in each of those particular areas where you do need specific skills, uh, recruiting the best people, aligning your people with your culture, um, you know, getting the, the best out of your people every day of the week, those kinds of things, uh, you can learn how to do that. You can empower yourself to 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 pick up those skills and then apply them in, in the workplace. Yeah, you had four keys to being a better manager, and we're going to go through some of these. Keep an open mind, which <laughs> that's all about, right? You gotta gotta be able to empower yourself. You gotta not fall prey to the Dunning Kruger effect. You know, think that you just because you had some one success that you've learned it all. Um, take the time to make good decisions and create an empowering culture, which I want to talk about, and obviously build and maintain trust. Right. So I thought it was interesting. You you talk about um, setting goals as a priority, and a lot of people are familiar with setting SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time frame, time bound, you use the words. Um, but you say that's outdated. So what's what's replaced SMART goals? 
I've got a friend, a colleague, a, a guy named Adam Creek. He was in the uh, 2008 Olympic team uh, for Canada, rowing team, and they won gold medal. And Adam's really thought about this a lot. He's he's a big goal setter. I mean, you have to be when you're an Olympian. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. For some reason, I guess you got to get Especially set, as a rower. Set, set, yeah, as a rower. So um, what he's developed, he's developed a system that he calls clear goals. And they're basically updated to the kind of agile world that we're in now, where you've really got to be able to move um, on a dime and then be more collaborative with the people you work with. So clear goals are, are, are clear stands for collaborative, speak of the devil. Um, mm-hmm. They should encourage employees to work collaboratively and in teams. The goals are limited. They should be limited in both scope and duration. They're emotional. They should tap into the emotion and energy and passion of your people. They should be appreciable. They should be not huge goals that you can't really accomplish. They should be broken into smaller goals that are more accomplishable. And as they add up, they become bigger. And then they should be refinable. Um, They should have um, uh, agility, being able to be agile and and modified as the the situations change around you. So clear goals are what he says, and I think it's a great approach. So what was the difference between limited and appreciable? Because they both sound, limited I understand, is is, one of the key things with goal setting is people have to feel some sense of achievement along the way in order to build the confidence to keep going. So that's why I interpret as limited, yeah. or, is that, or is that appreciable? Well, it's definitely limited. It's limited in both scope and duration. So yeah, it's, it's not a humongous goal, and it's not going to take uh, five years to accomplish, for example. So it's definitely limited. But appreciable definitely means it's broken down um, more into much smaller chunks that can be accomplished um, they're similar in a way. They probably overlap, but they but they're broken down so you can have lots of accomplishments more quickly. So instead of having to wait five years for this big accomplishment, you're actually accomplishing things maybe every week. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we could have weekly goals uh, instead of monthly or or quarterly or annual goals, so that you you feel that sense of accomplishment more often and, and more quickly. No matter where your sales team is working from, RingDNA can enable them to be more productive and effective. RingDNA offers a complete platform for remote sales teams that gives reps the tools they need to connect with more prospects and create more opportunities and drive more revenue no matter where they're working from. And managers can get real-time insight they need to coach reps to success. Win more deals from anywhere on the planet with RingDNA. Learn more about how RingDNA helps remote teams at ringdna.com slash remote work. That's ringdna.com slash remote work. New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast. And I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast miniseries titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Right, but also the people that work for you do. And I think this is the thing that first-time managers don't understand is that yeah, we we talk about it. Is you know, you're only going to succeed if your people succeed. Right. But the key to getting your people to succeed is that they, you know, you talk about setting clear goals, but also that that they achieve a sense of confidence and they build the sense of confidence in what they're doing that builds on itself, and they do that through achievement. So these lim- this idea of the limited goals is one that I'm a big advocate for. Is that you know, what are the milestones? What are the things where people can experience success in what they're doing? Right. And when they do that, then you can sort of start building, and maybe I can give you more responsibility next time or a bigger goal the next time. 
but you gotta you gotta build that in people. It just doesn't show up, and just encouraging them to do more <laughs> doesn't doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, you'll overwhelm them, and and that's not a way to build confidence. If they fail, I mean, failure is a part natural part of life and business. And we, we learn when we fail. And, and obviously, you've got to make your workplace a safe-to-fail environment where you can fail and, and learn. But you want those failures to happen fast. You want them to happen quickly. And you do want people to, to have the ability to, to actually succeed. So give them those small, you know, limited goals that they can knock out, boom, 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 and, and build that momentum of achievement that makes them feel like they've really accomplished something and, and builds confidence within them. Right. Well, another thing too that that I thought was interesting in a book that um, and people should read and dig into is is and this is this is a big thing is, is you talk about creating a, a learning organization and I sort of come at this from two different perspectives one of which you write about one you don't write about so specifically but but um, it's this idea that you have to sort of structure in order to learn from the experiences that you're having. That it just you know you have to be more disciplined about it as opposed to just assuming people are going to learn from it. Yeah, I mean, it's just like going to school. I mean, you go to school and they have textbooks and they have lesson plans and they have curricula that actually spell out what you're going going to learn, and, and that's a guide of, for learning. And in in the same way, in, in a business, you should have some sort of system that tracks the learning in your organization that, you know, the mistakes that were made, the successes that were achieved, all these different things hold lessons that people can learn from instead of reinventing the wheel, you know, 20 different times. Why not mistake, make the mistake once and then everybody learns from that? Um, why, you know, why not? Well, the military is very good at this, actually. And I remember reading about this a number of years ago is, is you yeah, know, they're very disciplined about creating especially like the army was the one i was reading about this whole lessons learned right after a an engagement or a certain action program whatever they very f- sit down very formally and document the lessons they learn from it and it becomes you know sort of part right. of the the operations manual going forward is yeah we've done this we don't have to recreate the wheel or we've encountered the situation before these are the lessons we learned and we're going to teach that to the people in our organization and that's a great approach. Uh, I'm not super f- familiar with the military how they work, but but yeah, that's a beautiful model for for learning in an, in any organization. I would say. Well, and I think that that what a lot of companies, at least on the sales side these days, are sort of assuming is that well, if we document this something in our CRM system that that that's available, anybody can learn from it. And I think it has to be much more systematic than that. I mean, it's a great to capture your, the experiences and so on in your CRM system. But I think as a manager, you should be cognizant of, of the things you're learning experientially, but also your team. And, and yeah, create, <laughs> create a document online, a shared doc or something right. that, that enables you to say, yeah, we've, we've encountered this. Or you're coaching a salesperson. Yeah, somebody went through. You're John across the... <laughs> The side of the other side, other side of the table went through this, and yeah, check out the doc and and see what he experienced. Yeah, and ideally, there, there's some incentive for people to do that because I mean, unfortunately, a lot of these docs, and I know back when I was in the business world myself, you know, these these well-meaning documents that we created ended up getting filed away, and no one ever looked at them again. So um, there's got to be some way to keep it active in front of people. And uh, give them an incentive to actually look at it and, and engage with it instead of just ignoring it. Yeah, well, I think that's managers have to integrate it into their process. I think that becomes yeah. part of it, right? It, that's what happens is you know sellers input data into systems and then it's never looked at again. And they right. know that they never look at it again. They know no one else is looking at it. So what's the incentive? But if it's actually used as a tool, then that can actually become quite effective. I thought it was interesting. You you, you say that. One of the fastest ways to uh, build a learning culture is to fire the top management team. <laughs> yeah, that's it's a, a little extreme, but it's true. I mean, uh, unfortunately, many of the obstacles to learning and, and many other things in an organization are right there in that top management team. Yeah, including the reluctance to invest in managers, training managers. Uh, and I think that's you know, something 
you think about when you're a manager, maybe your first management job coming up is, yeah, are you part of the solution or part of the problem? Right. You know, are you being are you being defensive about what you don't know or being vulnerable about what you don't know and open to keeping an open mind, as you talked about, on the key ingredients to going out and learning and acquiring the knowledge you need to help improve yourself. Right, exactly. Yeah, definitely. So the other part, the learning culture, though, and this one is is sort of a pet peeve of mine, is, is I think learning through experience is fantastic, but uh, most companies are are really bad about then educating their people about things that aren't experience based, but just new insights, new perspectives, new ta- you know, ways of looking at things, and and it's like, yeah, how come we're so bad at that? I mean, because in sales, I can speak to sales most specifically is is yeah, there's sales training, yeah, some of it's not, most of it's not very good, just because it's it's not delivered in a way that that is reinforced, integrated into practice. But when we do a bad job of, of sort of this, what I call sales education, right? It's right. okay. We're learning from experience. So that's how we, there's going to be a, a primary driver for most of us. But there's so much more. There's you know, a whole world of books and podcasts and all these other things out there. Is how do we encourage people to, to access that? How do we encourage as managers? How do we get people to, to want to learn? Yeah. Well, it's, 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 that's a great, great question because it all comes down to motivation People need to see that as something that's going to help them sell better. In the case of a salesperson, for example, you know why why should I take time out of my day um, when I could be selling? When I could be out there actually selling, you know, get, making phone calls out in the sales floor or whatever it might be. Why should I take any time away from that? Um, and how is this going to actually help me sell more? So you've got to make that connection. I mean, I think a sales manager has to make that connection with the salespeople that by doing these things, by listening to podcasts, TED Talks, um, reading some of these books, that you actually will become a better salesperson. You actually will sell more. And, and I don't know how, how some organizations structure themselves, but I would say you want to definitely incentivize that in some way, maybe with some sort of um, – badges or something. So if you accomplish these things, you'll get some sort of a, uh, award mm-hmm. or re- reward or something. So if you, if you actually engage in this curriculum, you actually check off the boxes that you've done this, you've done that, you've listened to this podcast, you've read this book, whatever the things may be, you'll get some sort of reward for that. You'll get some sort of recognition. Um, but they've still got to draw the connection between doing that, taking the time to do that and actually selling more or doing more, or whatever it may be. So, I think the manager has to make the help make that connection and and, and prove it to the the, the, the salesperson that they're going to you know gain in some way by doing that. And I think part of that is by modeling in their own behavior something that that the sellers want to sort of aspire to, right? I mean, if their manager is you know not actively engaged in learning, they know that. Yeah, they they see that. I mean, if if you know, I think managers should spend. 10% of their time in their own development, their own personal development. And if they're investing that amount of time in it, um, then, yeah, the people work for them see that. And they're going to see it not only in the conversations they have with the manager, but they're going to see it actually in the, you know, the actions the manager is taking to learn. To me, that, that is one of the best ways to motivate people and then give, inspire people to invest in their own development. Yeah, definitely. I think um, you know certainly every all all behavior um, begins from from self motivation. I believe, but when you've got someone when you when your boss is modeling that behavior, it gives you something to aspire to. It gives you something to um, you know look up to. And I think we all want mentors. We all and some obviously some managers act as mentors. Some are formal, some are informal, but we all want to have a model, someone we can, we can say, we can look up to and aspire to. Uh, and so if, if our boss is modeling that behavior, if, if they're doing those sorts of things, reading those books, listening to those podcasts, um, and maybe actually inviting their people to join them, mm-hmm. uh, maybe, you, maybe you set aside some time every week, um, half an hour, or whatever it might be, to actually engage and, and bring your team together. And Listen to a podcast, then and then interactively walk them through it. You know, start a conversation and see what what learnings 
people could, you know, got out of it. Instead of just sitting back there and, and, and teaching a class, I mean, actually get people to be engaged and in, in interacting in it. That could be a very good tool as well, I would think. Well, I think it is. And it's the managers, the sales managers that are doing that are finding that, and this is to another point you were writing about, which is a huge mistake first time managers make is when they have meetings, you know, they tend not to be very productive. Right. And this is a skill you have to learn to, to be able to run a productive sales meeting. And uh, yeah, consuming content collaboratively, jointly is certainly one way to spend time productively, especially if you structure, let's say, lessons and, and questions around it, whether it's listening to part of a podcast or reading a chapter out of a book or something. Because generally, what you see with new managers is, yeah, they want to, you know, do extensive reviews or they want to talk about something in depth with one person that's not of interest to the other people or a lot of times sales managers first time managers hold their meetings at the wrong time of day uh, and if it's not productive then the sellers resent it so this whole idea of having productive meetings is really a, is actually a big one I've seen some sales managers uh, lose their team if you will because they the managers the meetings they held were just unproductive yeah, um, unfortunately, meetings by nature are are unproductive. I mean, there's so many bad meetings out there, and uh, it really turns off the employees. And you know, the more it goes on, the worse it gets. I think the statistics—I don't remember the the studies—but something like sixty-seven percent of all you know meetings are a waste of time. Something like that. I mean, it's it's a huge majority of meetings are are basically a waste of time. So people game them, people tune out, people attend them, but they, they wish they were somewhere else. Again, they wish they were selling. You know, they were out, out on the sales floor, out on the phone or doing whatever they do to sell instead of sitting in a, another, another meeting, you know, going, talking about stuff that has nothing to do with them selling or them doing their job, whatever their job may be. Well, that's why I think managers at all levels have this obligation to, uh, it's sort of the model I use. I consider a meeting like a sales call. You know, if I'm going on a sales call and consuming some of my customer's time, I want the meeting to be, you know, as long as it needs to be and not a minute longer. So relatively short, it needs to be focused, and there needs to be a specific deliverable that has value to the, the people in the meeting. And if you structure your sales calls that way, then think about structuring your sales meetings that way if you're a frontline manager. And then you'll ensure that that a, they're shorter. People walk out of there thinking, yeah, I got something out of this, so I'm not going to be distracted necessarily the next time we get together. And and imagine that people are calculating sort of a mental ROI on the time they invest in that meeting, just like your customers do when you meet with them. Exactly. Yeah. And and you know they are. I mean, people aren't people are 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 watching the, the clock tick by and thinking about all the other things they could be doing at that time if they're not benefiting from the discussion in the meeting. Yeah. Well, and so Sort of last question. I thought it was a great point you made toward the end of the book is is you talk about frontline managers increasing well, frontline managers increasingly being the source of of frustration with with people in the jobs that report to them. It's why they change jobs frequently. Gallup talked about that as you mentioned. Uh, but Gallup also has statistics, which I believe you mentioned in the book about what a large fraction of of workers are just not engaged. Right. And um and this is a problem because, you know, if you're not engaged, and especially if you're in sales, that's, this is sort of the recipe for mediocre performance is you're just going to be going through the motions. And I, and I thought one of the great things you wrote about in there is that the key for managers on this to sort of uh, increase engagement is on their own part is don't resist change. You know, don't have that open mind you talked about is be open to new perspectives, new ways of doing things, input from the people that work for you about what you could do better. Yeah, I mean, so much of this is attitude, and you know, we talked about that a little bit before. But you know, when people are open to change, when people are open to new ideas, when people um, understand that what got them where they are today may not work for them any longer, they may need to change their their approach because the world's changing around them, and it's changing faster than ever. Just relying on what got you to where you are right now, um, there's no guarantee that that's going to work today or tomorrow. So uh, it's critically important to be open to new ideas, to, the, to, to a changing world, to your people's ideas, 
to inputs from all sorts of different places that maybe you've never considered before. Because, you know, whether or not you decide to jump on board the train, it's going to, it's going anyway. It's going with or without you. So <laughs> you might want to get on board the train. Yeah. Well, I think they're all subtext there too, is that, that the first temptation as a new manager is to try to control everything. And you're much better off acknowledging from the beginning that there's very little you can control and, and acknowledging that and then helping in the ways that, that I said that have value to people and understanding that, yeah, there's some things you're not going to be able to control and that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, th- you just can't control e- everything and you shouldn't even try. I think that's where one, you know, one place where managers really go wrong is, is they, they don't delegate um, work to their people. They try to do it all themselves. So that's that's one form of control. I know when I was a manager um, years ago that whenever I had a task, say my boss said, I need you to come up with a report, some sort of report, uh, my immediate reaction was, well, should I do it myself or should I assign this to one of my employees? And if I do it myself, I know it's going to be done two or three times faster and it'll probably be twice as accurate. So maybe I'll just do it myself. Well, what I've done is I've just burdened myself with more work when I should have, you know, I shouldn't be trying to control everything. I shouldn't be trying to do everything. And then I, I've taken away a, a possibility of, of developing an employee. I've, I've taken away their ability to learn something new that will benefit them and actually benefit our entire organization and our customers if they learn this themselves and are able to do this themselves instead of me doing it for them all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love it. Well, good. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but um, Peter, tell people how they can connect with you and learn more about uh, your book. Uh, The best way to connect with me is to go to my website, petereconomy.com, and uh, everything's there. I've got a sample on the homepage of my website there, a sample of the book. You can take a look at it, and a place to uh, wander over to Amazon if you decide you want to buy a copy. So um, that's pretty much it. And follow you at Inc. Magazine. You've written, what, 1,500 uh, articles for them. Yeah, more than 1,500 articles. Yeah, on Inc.com. Um, all about leadership management and uh, all sorts of other topics, too. Yeah. And you have one of the great names of all time, Peter Economy. So, uh, for a business writer, fantastic. <laughs> it's It's been a, a real blessing, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, Peter, thank you very much, and I look forward to doing this again. Thanks, Andy. Had a blast. Okay, friends, that's it for this episode. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. I am so grateful for your support of this show. And I want to thank Peter Economy for sharing his insights with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul, on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this podcast. If you could also leave us a rating or a review and let us know how we're doing, we'd really appreciate it. And you can do all that on your phone in less than a minute as soon as this podcast is over. So thank you for your help with that. And thank you so much for investing your time to join me today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. RingDNA is the leading sales enablement platform that uses AI to help scale business growth. Trusted by the top companies across the globe, RingDNA offers a suite of powerful tools for every sales role. The RingDNA dialer radically improves sales productivity and call connection rates, while guided selling helps reps know exactly what to do and when to do it. Conversation AI uses artificial intelligence to surface the most impactful coaching opportunities in real time. So no matter where your team is working from, the Ring DNA platform can help them exponentially increase call connections, opportunities, and revenue. Learn more at ringdna.com/platform. That's ringdna.com/platform.